we're not supposed to, maybe we are, get a workout in church. You know what I'm saying? I feel like I've been on a get in shape track or something like that. This, that praise, yes, indeed. Uh, yes, indeed. So listen, I'm going to do something kind of to calm myself down a little bit because, whoo, right now. All right. Um, um, and so y'all know sometimes I'll start off with a song, a hymn of uh, meditation. In, in, in the church I grew up in, that's something that was done. So, so praise and worship, that's us giving it up for God. You know, thank you, Lord, and, and, and you are worthy. When we come to this time where we're receiving his word, that, that hymn of meditation gives us a chance to kind of transition from giving that praise to receiving what he has. And that is what, who this is. So let's see, can I bring, yeah, okay. All right. Um, how does that song start? How does I surrender all start? Oh, there it is. <laughs> All to Jesus I surrender, all to Thee I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence. Daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Man, y'all sound good. Do this for me. Help me surrender all. Help me surrender all. Oh, all to thee, my blessed. Savior, help me surrender all. Ooh, yes. <laughs> Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your son. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the fact, the truth, that even though we jacked up your creation, you responded not in wrath but in love by sending us your son. God, we thank you for your word that instructs us who you are, of your great love for us, of how we are to live for you. We thank you for the word that you have for us this morning. Now, Lord, it is a Oh, rich word. And it's a challenging word as well. So, Father, where we don't want to surrender, because those of us in the room like me, sometimes we don't want to surrender. So we're not being cute saying, help me surrender. Help us to surrender. Father, right now, prepare our hearts to receive your word. Get me out of the way. Allow me to be your vessel, your conduit, and just do what you do. Penetrate our hearts hearts. Hide me so that I not be seen, but instead you be seen. Mute me so that I not be heard, but you be heard and give us a fresh experience with you. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Good morning one more time, church. So listen, I'm still amped. A um, couple of things. One, I'm going to tell you straight up. I don't know what I'm about to say to y'all. Yes, I prepared. So no, we're not just winging it, but I don't. And the reason that matters is there's this wonderful crew back there that works pro presenter. They're the people that makes the words come up on the slides. They have a script. I'm probably not about to be anywhere near that. So as we're talking, please lift them. Y'all laughing and I am so not joking. So here's the deal. I may talk at this place the whole time. I don't know. This word this morning, it's been tearing me up. And the reason it's been tearing me up is because of how powerful it is and because of the power that I know that it will unleash in your life if you will take hold to it and walk in it. And so I've been sitting up here laboring over this thing going, Lord, you know what I'm saying? What if I don't do it right? Or, <laughs> and all this stuff. Or what if I give them your word, but it doesn't really take root and they don't take off with it? He did check me and say, boy, sit your... This is how the Lord talks to me. So, you know, this is how we get down. Sit yourself down somewhere. 
You give them my word. I do all the activation. So that's what we're about to do. Know this. Uh, one other thing. I tend not to use me as an example when it's a positive thing. It's just, just what it is. Because I never want it to sound like, oh, I got it all together. And y'all need to be like me. Because, woo, you model yourself after me if you want to. You're going to live in the land of jacked up. There are, though, some things that the Lord has allowed me to walk in, and, 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 and I cannot not share that with you because of the power that I know is in it. That stated, if you've been with us for the past month or so, you know that we're walking through a journey of on that clock isn't moving. Oh, there it is. All right, because that's what's going to keep me. All right, so a journey through the book of Proverbs. If you have not listened to the June 23rd Proverbs sermon that kicked this off by Phil Kwan, uh, Words of Wisdom for a Blessed Life, go listen to it. That was phenomenal. And I highlight it because it set the foundation for all of the subsequent sermons that you're hearing on, found, on uh, Proverbs, on how to properly digest what's in Proverbs because there are some challenging things in there. There are some things that you like, I see what you said in there, but that ain't what I'm experiencing in life and all of that. And so this wisdom book that's part of that trilogy, how to put it all together and properly interpret it, if you've not listened to it, go listen to that sermon. As a, a, a teaser, I'll say this. There's one thing that I think Phil got blatantly wrong and he ought to be shamed on himself, of himself because he misled this congregation. I do not like raisins. <laughs> now, if you were here, you know what that's about. If not, go listen to that message you can chuckle to. That stated, this morning, we are in the book of Proverbs in the 11th chapter. We're going to come from verses 24 through 28. Church, what's in here? If we walk this out, it will revolutionize your treasure chest. I had an intro. I'm not doing it. There's your intro. It will revolutionize your treasure chest. So we're going to jump into God's word and just see where we go this morning. If you would, stand to your feet in honor of God's word. Coming from the 11th chapter of Proverbs, we'll start at verse 24. It reads like this. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessings will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. The people curse him who holds back grain, but a blessing is on the head of him who sells it. Whoever diligently seeks good seeks favor, but evil comes to him who searches for it. Whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. So reads the word of God. You may be seated. Now, some of you heard that and went, yeah, I get it. Some of you heard that and went, riddle me this, Batman. What? <laughs> Let me tell you the point of this excerpt. If you are generous, you will be blessed. That's it. Those five, I think that's five verses. Five verses say in different ways, if you're generous, you will be blessed. The thing, though, about this is there's some counterintuitive stuff going on with it, even the way it starts. One uh, gives freely, yet grows all the richer. So I may not be a mathematician, but I got a little adding sense. If Jimmy has two apples and Jimmy gives away two apples, Jimmy has zero apples. Jimmy ain't rich. What are you talking about? Right? That doesn't add up. Oh, generosity right quick. So generosity gets a bad rap. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I forgot to tell you this too. If I were to title this sermon, it would be generosity. Let's lay up treasure. That would be the title. Now, generosity gets a bad rap because you heard me say that. One, people start thinking money. Ah, here we go. You about to ask me, don't pay my mortgage, go pay the church and all that stuff. That's not what... And I don't make a dime from Wood's Edge. I serve as an elder. I don't get paid. You can give your whole checks, and I will get not 13 or 2 cents from it. There's that disclaimer. So, so I, I'm not compelled to tell you give money because I, I ain't in nothing. I give generously because the Lord has blessed me to do that. This is about so much more than money. And generosity, um, Webster defines it something like this. It's giving more than what's required or expected. 
Yeah. And, and I would add to it from a biblical perspective, obediently and sacrificially giving more than what's required or expected. Let me tell you off the top of this. Again, I'm going to repeat myself. If what you hear me talking about the whole time is money, you are so, yeah, that's a part of it, but you're going to miss so much. Some of the most generous stuff out there is the gifting of your time. I say that it's a trifecta of T's, time, talent, and treasure. And that's what we're talking about this morning. And so this thing is talking about, you know, he who, who gives is going to be uh, made rich or, or, or grows all the richer. And then another who withholds, withholds uh, uh, only suffers want. And you're going to see these uh, contrasts through each one of these verses. So, so I submit to you, everything the Lord has gifted you with is not intended to stay with you. Some stuff the Lord intends to use you as a conduit, a pass-through. Where did I get that from? Well, this says another withholds what he should give. That suggests that that other has received something, and he's holding on to that which he received, but he's not supposed to hold on to it, and we know that because it says he withheld what he should give. As a consequence, he suffered, consequence, he suffered want. Have you ever been in a position, you don't have to answer out loud, but the answer is yes, so you may as well. Have you ever been in a position where you don't have contentment? You're like, Lord, if, if I could just get that raise, then I'd be all right. If I could just get that promotion, if I could just get some appreciation, if I could just get that mate that could turn into my spouse, then, Lord, I'd be all right. But you get that promotion, and it didn't do all the stuff that it needed to do. So you're saying, Lord, if I could just get, that's want. And we end up suffering want. And the thing that we want to do is get to this place called contentment. What is contentment? Contentment is being okay with where I am, but not just okay. It's being in this place and trusting, Lord, I am where you have me and you are dealing favorably with me. Yeah, yeah. Tony Evans said something like, uh, it is having inner sufficiency despite external circumstances. Woo. When he has us in a place that I feel like, Lord, in the middle of this stuff that I am, you are dealing rightly with me, and I am so good with that. All right, all right. That is a place to be. So let's, let's look at um, Matthew 6. 19 through 21, it says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break, and steal, break in and steal. Pause right there. So, so this thing also gets a bad rap because we say, see, the Lord said, don't lay up treasures. That ain't what he said. He's saying, I want you to lay up treasures, but I want you to do it the right way and in the right place. Put those two verses together. He says, lay up treasure. What he's saying is, don't do it this way. Don't try to store it up here on earth. That's the thing about moths and rust. But store it up in heaven. I want you to store up treasure. And he goes on to say, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So the Lord wants us to lay up treasures, but a particular kind in a particular way. That should raise a question to us. Well, what does that look like and how am I supposed to lay that treasure up? Y'all are some brilliant questionnaires. So let's look at that. But before we jump into that, tell me something. Are there people that you don't like lending to? <laughs> tell the truth. You know what I'm saying? I want to lend you my stuff. Last time I lent you my stuff, you didn't pay me back. Last time I lent you my stuff, you tore the stuff up. But now you, I lent you something, and it came back shinier than when, when it left me. I can get down with you. What if you had the opportunity to lend to the Lord? Stick a pen in that. Proverbs 22, 9. Whoever has a bountiful eye, some translations say is generous, will be blessed for he shares his bread, bread with the poor. Whoever, whoever is generous will be blessed because he shares his bread with the poor. The poor, the people that cannot do for themselves and that cannot do back for you. Y'all got that? Yeah, yeah. 
Now, now we're going to see a lot about giving to the poor, those who can't do for themselves. Okay, that sounds good, bro, but you said something about lending to the Lord. Can we get to that part? All right, that's cool. We'll do that. Proverbs 19, 17. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he, the Lord, will repay him for his deed. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and the Lord will repay him for his deed. Some people are right there with me, and some are like, why is he so excited about this? That's a good question. So let's answer that one too. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. The point is this. Now, there's an immutable truth that we're about to hit in verse 8 of this. Immutable truth is a fancy way of saying it's something that does not change and cannot be contradicted. Because some would say, well, this is when Paul was talking to the church at Corinth about an offering for Macedonia. I know that. So don't tell me it doesn't apply because verse 8 applies across the board. All right, so here we go. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves what? A cheerful giver. Here it is. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Leave verse 8 up there right quick. God is able to make, what does that say? All grace abound. Everything that comes after this is talking about you. So that means you are the one that will have all sufficiency in all things at all times. That right there is shout worthy. Y'all ain't got to shout because I can shout by myself. Listen, I don't almost tore the carpet up in my closet shouting off this joint right here. Let's talk about why right quick, okay? I'm going to take you on a little journey. It's, it's a two-part thing. I really don't know what all stuff about to come out of my mouth, so let's see where it goes. Um, here it goes. So the Lord had me in 2017 start a business. I don't talk about it a lot because I don't want this platform to be there, but this has relevance, all right? So he had me start this business. I didn't want to do it. Matter of fact, I said I wasn't going to do it. My wife told me that's dumb to blatantly disobey the Lord. She told it to me twice. So we started the business. So here we are. Started this business. I'm, my, my, my job that I had, we're doing fine. I'm the answer man, baby. I mean, it was the Lord, but people come to me with stuff they can't solve and then the Lord will go and they do it and it worked. Here I am. I am the dumbest, most incompetent anything you have ever met in your life. I can't get business. People don't want to talk to me. You're just a risk. I ha- we saved money, paid off everything but the house by the grace of God and, and, and had six months living expenses stored up. And a year's severance. Yeah. Ate through that severance like a champ. Yeah. Ate through that six months like a champ. And here I am at a low because I feel like an incompetent idiot if I can say that to y'all, but that's how I felt. Now, I have a mentor who also started a business before me. His business is doing very well. And so I'm talking to him about this, right? And he tells me, he say, look here, man, let me tell you something. I got to the point where I was depressed. I didn't even want to get out of my bed. And, and, and I got to the point, we're living in the city because we want our kids to be able to go to the school. And I decided I'm going to lose the house. And, and, and I finally got to a place where I said, Lord, you know what? Fine. Because he had missed some payments, and he is not financially irresponsible. He had missed some payments, and they're talking about foreclosure. He said, I, I finally got to a point, D, where I just said, Lord, okay. If I ain't supposed to have this house, cool. If my kids aren't supposed to be in the school I want them in, cool. That's not your will. I thought it was. It's mine. No problem. I didn't want to get out of bed, so what I started doing is I started serving. I went to this organization, and I just started serving, man, because that was the thing that would get me out of bed. So I was sacrificially serving. I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills or when I'm getting kicked out of this house, and I started serving. He said, man, next thing I know, the phone rang, and it turned into business, and then the phone rang, and then it turned into business, and here the Lord is blessing me. Hold on. I said, all right, cool. So I'm sitting here, right, and I'm in front of my desk, and I don't even know what time of night it was, and I'm at an all-time low, and my wife comes in to me. Now, you want to talk about riches? I told you riches is, about, riches is about more than just money. Let's talk about riches, because I know some people who started businesses, and when the finances tanked, their marriage ended. So here I am in my pity party, and my wife comes to the door, and she says to me, look at me. I don't want to look at her. I don't. She said, look at me. What? She said, I'm proud of you. I said, what? She said, I'm proud of you. For what? Oh, and then I went in. For draining our resources like a champ? 
oh, I did that for not getting anybody to talk to me. Oh, I can do that. And I went down and she just patiently let me finish. And she looked at me with admiration. That's Rich's number one. Here I am down in this spot and my wife is looking at me with admiration. That's rich, baby. And then she says to me, you are teaching our children. Whoo. Mm. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. You are teaching our children what it means and what it looks like to obey God even when it doesn't make sense. Matter of fact, to obey God when it looks like it's the wrong thing to do. They'll never get that out of a sermon. I'm telling you, that's rich. God put me in a place where even though I didn't know if I was going to be able to stay in the house that I was in, I'm sleeping in peace. That's rich. God has given me health in the midst of this situation. That's rich. God has given me an opportunity to teach my children by walking it out what it looks like to trust him. That's rich. So here I am not knowing how this bill is going to get paid, but I'm diligently, and I did. I started uh, serving, and I, I was grinding. Don't get it wrong. I kissed my babies before they woke up, and I kissed my babies when they were asleep because that's when I left the house and when I came back home. And the Lord enriched, the Lord made me rich with stuff that didn't have anything to do with money. There are people who are rich in finances killing themselves, taking their lives because they don't have peace and because of the frustration and because of the high levels of anxiety. And the Lord is telling us, listen, I want you to be generous and if you give, I got you. That's rich. Okay, the next verse, uh, verse 25, it says, whoever brings blessing will be enriched. One who waters will himself be watered. Same theme, okay? And if you're bringing blessings, that means you're bringing blessings for somebody that's not you. If you're watering, you're watering not yourself. And if you're doing that, then you will be enriched and you will be watered. Richer in verse 24 uh, is translated as increased. Enriched is translated as made prosperous. Watered a lot of times presents in the Old Testament is made fat. This is what he's doing. And then in 26, it says the uh, people curse him who holds back grain, but a blessing is on the head of them who sells it. This concept of holding back grain, what that says is there's a time of need. In this time of need, I have grain, so I'm going to hoard it to increase the need. And as the need increases, then I can exploit the people that need it. And then I take advantage of them. The people curse him. Conversely, the one who sells the uh, grain will be blessed, blessings on him. That picture is um, Joseph around Genesis 41 when he interpreted the uh, 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 king's dream and understands that there's about to be this famine. And so for seven years, what he did is he had them store up grain, right? We sacrificed and didn't live off all the Lord blessed us with because we know something is coming. And so he was very judicious with this. And so they store up this grain for seven years, stored up so much grain they couldn't count it anymore. Famine hits. Famine spreads well beyond Egypt. And because of him obediently storing up the grain, not living off of everything. Now they're in a position that they can sell grain. They're not taking advantage of the people, but the people are paying a reasonable price for the sustenance that they need. Blessed is the one who is prudent in that way is what this saying is saying. And it says, whoever diligently seeks good seeks favor, but evil comes to him who searches for it. This favor here is acceptance and, 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 and being acceptable. A quick thing right quick. There's a difference between looking and um, seeking. So I do it like this. Let's say you about to get married. You bought a ring. Your wedding is a month off. You misplaced your ring. You're going to look for that ring. Don't get it twisted, but you're not freaking out. All right. Conversely, let's say same situation. You're the best man. The groom has given you the ring. It's the morning of the wedding. You can't find that ring. You're not looking for the ring. You are diligently seeking to find that ring. The Lord says, blessed is the one who diligently seeks good. That again is outward focus, not inward focus. And he's saying that if we would be generous, then blessings will come to us. And then he says, whoever trusts in his riches would fall, but righteous will flourish like a green leaf. First 
1 Timothy 6, 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, as for the rich in this present age, I know a lot of us say, well, you're not talking to me, you're talking about you, I ain't rich. Uh, John Carswell is somewhere in the house. He's a person that travels the globe doing missionary work. I'm looking at Ken, he does the same thing. Let me tell you something. If you, if you take a global worldview, not an America worldview, a global worldview, what you'll learn is every one of us in this room is the rich that they're talking about. You may be struggling to make ends meet. I'm not like making light of your situation or anything else, but let me tell you something. Those of us who are going home to an, a sheltered place, like with a light switch, that at least most of the time that light comes on when you click it, this is talking to us. So, as for the rich in this present age, oh, one more thing. So in this, this is Paul writing to Timothy. Young Timothy is going to lead the church, right? And so he's imparting wisdom to young Timothy, and he has told him above this, hey, look here, don't go seeking riches, because uh, uh, that'll get you in a bad place, basically. And, and this is where the verse is that says uh, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Boy, we twist that verse all out. of. But anyway, um, and, 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 and it talks about that. But for the rich, because some are rich. So for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So what should we do? They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. What he said here is, hey, there's a risk, uh, a danger, a danger of being rich. And that danger is you'll fool around and trust the provision instead of the provider. Uh And when the provision tends to part paths with you, then we got a big problem. Because my eye is on the provision and not the provider. So if you are rich, I've got instruction for you, says the word. Trust the provider. And in trusting the provider, I want you to be rich in blessing others. All right, all right. Word of God. Mark. No, don't want to do that one. A few examples right quick. Where am I? All right. Uh, I'm going to rush through these two. So, 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 uh, let's do this one. It's, it's, it's 1990-something, early 90s. I'm driving to college, Prairie View, a and University. Woo, woo. All right, then. So, I'm, I'm headed to PV. Uh, uh, I'm going down 290. The year matters because there's not stuff down 290 except for cars and trees. All right? That's it. I run out of gas. There is no excuse for this. It's cold outside. Here I am, out of gas, on 290. I don't know how many miles I am from a gas station. So I put my coat on, I got my beanie cap on, and I'm walking down the street mad at myself. I, trees and cars. I don't know how many hours I'm going to be walking. And right now, I do not look pick upable. <laughs> this woman pulls over and picks me up. I get in the car with her. She takes me for miles to a gas station. I go in. I purchase a gas can, purchase some gas. I'm like, I'm appreciative of this, but I know I'm walking back to my car. She waits for me. She takes me miles back to my car. We're talking a little bit. She tells me she was headed to a job interview. That was a phone interview. She, instead of doing that, takes me. I said, why would you do that? She said, because you look like you needed help. That impacted my life and how I dealt with others. Got another one for you. These are your 21st century parables. Let me tell you what, what generosity looks like. Generosity looks like barrel coming and blowing your fence and your retaining wall on the ground and you walking out, oh, and your two trees in the front yard and you walking outside and seeing your neighbor come with his kids in tow and a pair of work gloves saying, you look like you could need some help. Hey. That's generosity. Yeah, yeah. 
Generosity looks like my godmother, and in this that I'm about to share, I take nothing away from my mother mother, but I can't start talking about her because I will be crying, and then we'll be here through tomorrow. And so my godmother had five kids before I was born, and she decided to take me in and time share this little runty ball of energy. I've been energetic, I think, all my life. And so, and so here she is with these kids, and, she, and, and, and listen, I had my family of origin issues, all right? There it is. It's part of our testimony. And, and sometimes getting out of my house was respite. And so she became the place I could do no wrong at her house. My God, siblings probably wanted to, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, nothing but the grace of God that I'm still here and they didn't kill me. But she poured into me all my life, into my adult life. I mean, she's now in the arms, in the presence of God, but all my life. You know what? I never knew growing up of the marital issues that she was facing. I never knew growing up of the financial issues that she was facing. I never knew until her funeral that she was a bank to so many people who never paid her back. I never knew that she suffered with depression. And I never knew it because all she ever poured into me is love. That generosity is what has... I almost said that in the way I wasn't supposed to say it. Uh, What has me standing before you right now? Because she stepped out of herself and in her need poured into me because she saw me and my need. That's generosity. The Lord blesses generosity, card-carrying member. Um, it, okay, how to walk this out. Let's do that. Let's do application. How to walk this out. I'm going to give you four steps because it starts, ends, and is filled with the Holy Spirit. And so the first thing that we want to do is ask him, Holy Spirit, sensitize me to your voice and to your nudging. And then once you make it to where I can hear you clearly, Holy Spirit, make me aware of the needs around me. I submit to you, he doesn't need to put you in the middle of new needs. You're already in the middle of needs. It's just that we need to have the scales drop from our eyes so that we can see the needs around us. And then Holy Spirit, make me aware of what you want me to do with those needs. Now, let me tell you something. I believe if you ask the Holy Spirit this stuff, he will do it. And I believe when you get to step three, You might not like what he tells you. So, Holy Spirit, change my heart to obediently trust you. I don't know what you're struggling with today. And I'm not trying to belittle your struggle. There is so much anxiety, uh, 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 frustration, lack of peace, medical issues, marital issues, and all kinds of other issues in this room and on the world wide web, wherever you are watching this right now, we are being suffocated by stuff. And yes, I am bold enough to stand and look you in your face in the middle of your stuff and say the Lord is calling us to be generous, to look outside ourselves, to be a blessing to those who cannot bless us back. And that's tough when you're struggling yourself. It's tough. That's right. Uh, Y'all couldn't hear, but one of the kids said, tough! (laughs) From the mouth of babes. But my brothers and my sisters, when I tell you, you will be so blessed if you are willing to obediently walk in a sacrificial service. One more example and then closing illustration. I was blessed to be partnered with a mentor, uh, an executive from Forney Construction, and I'm naming them. If you go on their website, you will see Forney gives away 33% of their profits to all kind of places. They started that from their inception or shortly after their inception. And I know it's real because I got an inside view to it. Now, you know what's hard? What's hard is when you're a startup business committing to business owners, committing to giving away some percentage of your profits when you become profitable for us uh, or how we started. You know what's hard? Becoming profitable and 33% turning into a number that has more than one comma in it. 
and committing to continuously doing that. They have been able to bless so many people. You walk into their conference rooms, there's scriptures all over the wall, and they are unapologetic about who they serve. And the Lord has blessed them. Hear me clearly. I am not preaching a prosperity gospel like an American prosperity gospel. Of if, you, if you sow this seed of $5, then the Lord will turn that over 12-fold, and your bank account is magically. I ain't telling you that. He might. But he may not do it that way. Riches is so much more than money. And I told you where I was, so that's not easy for you to say, Mr. Pay Your Bills Well all the time. Nope. (laughs) But it's easy for me to say because I've been kept by God and cradled in his grace and his protection and his favor. He has walked me through not being able to see two steps in front of me. And then when I could see the two steps, they looked stupid. Yeah. But he taught me how to take them anyway. And I stand before you right now as a testament Uh to the power of my God and of walking sacrificially in obedience and generosity. Closing illustration. The story is told that one day a beggar by the roadside asked for alms from Alexander the Great as he passed by. The man was poor and wretched and had no claim upon the ruler, no right even to lift a solicitous hand. Yet the emperor threw him several gold coins. A courtier was astonished at his generosity and commented, Sir, copper coins would adequately meet a beggar's need. Why give him gold? Alexander responded in royal fashion. Copper coins would suit the beggar's need, but gold coins suit Alexander's giving. Contrast the value that this king placed on himself to the value that we should place on God on his worth, on his direction and instruction? What if our generosity accurately reflected his value? And church, let me tell you something. In reality, our generosity is an accurate representation of the value that we place on him, on his worth, on his direction, on his instruction. Difficult though it may be, let us be found trusting God, taking him at his word walking in self-sacrificial obedience, even in generosity, I am a living testimony. It pays off. Let's lay up treasure. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your instruction. We thank you even, Lord, for the challenges that you uh, afford us. God, we thank you that we have the ability to trust you. We thank you for your great care. God, this for many of us is a challenging thing to work out. Lord, help us to trust you and do it, though. Help us to place it in your hands, to listen to your voice, to understand what you're saying, to see the need, to understand how you want us to move in and on that need and to do it. Give us contentment in obeying you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.